Welcome back to my writer's room, everyone, and welcome back to 12 Days of Ham Shackles Hangry Holiday Haymakers. I'm Matt Wallace, YouTube's resident angry writer, and uh, up until Christmas Eve, I'm counting down 12 days of uh, action movies to break up that saturan holiday viewing we are all endlessly subjected to around this time of year. Because let's face it, during the holidays, at least once, if not more, you just want to watch somebody kick somebody else in the head, if not kick someone else in the head yourself. So this is this is how we exercise that. By going back to the 80s and 90s, to the glory days of B, martial arts and action movies, and digging out some old favorites, some old gems. I'm trying to introduce you to the stuff that I grew up with, stuff you might have missed, stuff maybe you're glad that you missed, but uh, that's what we're doing. So for day two... I have uh, a real hidden gem uh, from the 90s. It's actually one of my uh, one of my favorites. We've got 1993's Full Contact, starring none other than Jerry Golden Boy Tremble. Uh, <laughs> as you can see, it was from the era when movies were sold based on how many champion kickboxers they had in the movie. Four world champion kickboxers uh, deliver world class action. Sorry. But yeah, Jerry Tremble um, was a strong-jawed Midwestern boy, uh, you know, fair to middling actor, talented martial artist. He was actually on that kind of sadly failed end of the spectrum of uh, that 80s, 90, uh, 90s trend of trying to port legitimate kickboxers to becoming action movie stars. He only starred in a couple of flicks in the 90s. He's been in in a lot of movies over the years, but this one was one of his only like starring roles. He never uh, reached the stratus of like a Don the Dragon Wilson or a Michael Dudikoff or a Jeff Speakman. You know, he just, he never kind of made it over the hump out of that glut of uh, the influx of legitimate martial artists in Hollywood trying to make it in the 80s and 90s. He did oddly turn up in the Michael Mann movie Heat. Uh, you know, the huge, big-budget, award-winning Michael Mann movie Heat with Al Pacino and Robert De Niro as one of the cops on Al Pacino's team. Randomly, he was the cop, if you've seen Heat, he gets shot in the arm in the big bank heist, and he's on the phone with Al Pacino later, and Al Pacino asks him how he's doing. That's like his big scene in the movie. But uh, I always wanted to know, like, who Jerry Tremble knew on the Michael Mann production of Heat because like that is such a random thing for him to turn up in that movie. Also, he didn't get to kick anybody in the head, which I was really sad about. But anyway, uh, though he didn't star in many movies, one of them was uh, this uh, forgotten uh, little B movie from 1993, not to be confused with the 1992 Full Contact starring Chow Young Fat. Uh, also not to be confused with the Jean-Claude Van Damme movie Lionheart, although it does share Coincidentally, shares a lot with that movie's plot, and also Lionheart was also called Full Contact in some territories. <laughs> so you see how incestuous the B martial arts movie scene um, in the 90s was. Uh, Jerry Trimble plays Fresno farm boy Luke Powers, who comes to the big city to uh, because, because as he says in the movie, times is hard for farmers. <laughs> He doesn't say is, but he, that's, that is a line from the movie. Comes to the big city to find his brother and try to make some real money, only to discover that his brother has been murdered after competing in and winning a big fight in an underground uh, martial arts tournament known as Alley Fights. Uh, his brother <laughs> wins a big fight in the tournament, wins a bunch of money, and as he's celebrating, he's ambushed and killed by a mysterious figure, and no one knows who did it. But once Jerry uh, figures it out, once Luke, I'm sorry, Luke Powers, Luke Powers, I love that. That's such a classic B-movie uh, action name. Once Luke learns about it, he is determined to figure out who killed his brother and take revenge. And how is he going to do that? Well, there's only one way. By entering alley fights, by entering the tournament himself and rooting out the killer. Uh, because it could be anybody in the fighting tournament. It could be the stoic Black Ice the silent assassin. It could be the uh, loud, brash tournament favorite, Ahmed Mustafa. <laughs> uh, it could be the affable hustler, um, Albert, who uh, Luke befriends upon entering town. Uh, it could be anybody in the tournament, but to, but to figure out this murder mystery, because it's a murder mystery combined with like a tournament movie, Luke has to enter the fights, uh, but he'll need help. And this is where Full Contact really gets elevated above a very prototypical B martial arts uh, beat-em-up. Uh, Luke finds help in the form of Pep, a, uh, 
a homeless alcoholic veteran sensei <laughs> that he meets his first day in the big city. Uh, Pep takes Luke under his wing and offers to train him to win alley fights. And uh, the character of Pep is played by an actor, a dude from the early 90s, with my favorite uh, name ever. If it's his real name, it's amazing. If it's the acting name he chose, it's even more amazing. Pep is played by Marcus Aurelius. And I love that to death. And I will always remember that actor uh, because of that name. He didn't do a lot of movies. I honestly think this was this might have been his biggest uh, role as Pep in Full Contact. But Pep is what makes this movie on a number of levels. Um, as I said, the script, uh, the very average script, <coughs> actually has some very unexpected, elegant touches in it. Firmly mired in the genre, and we'll get to the triggers and tropes um, in a minute. Firmly mired in the genre, but manages to subvert a lot of expectations where these movies did not often do that. These were often extremely rote flicks. But in full contact with the character of Pep, Marcus Aurelius brings so much like charm and humor and very like in a very hammy way. Like he's very clearly a B-movie actor. I'm not saying that Marcus Aurelius is an amazing thespian, thespian. But in the role of Pep, he's re he really does bring a lot of charm and humor and unexpected um, pleasure to an otherwise very by the by the book movie. Um, you know, it's it's one of those classic uh, sensei training roles where, but but kind of flipped on his ear with sort of like an L.A. street thing. You know, he does things like take uh, Luke out and have the neighborhood kids take rotten tomatoes and throw them at Luke to teach Luke defense. Um, he has him like try to outrun city buses and he's going to reward him with a bagel if he can do it. And all through the movie, um, Pep has this recliner that he sits in wherever they go in the streets because they never train inside because he's the I'm actually I say he's homeless. They never really specify that. But the implication is he's poor, if not homeless. So they're always out training in the streets of L.A. because the movie was shot in the valley like every other uh, action movie back then. But he has this recliner chair that he sits in whenever he, whenever he instructs Luke. And he makes Luke carry this recliner with them wherever it goes, wherever they go. And it's just, it's like, one, it's like those kind of running gags that really set the role apart. But the, the thing that I really like about it, and this is going to get into spoiler territory. If you want to seek this out and watch it and you don't want the movie, you don't want the murder mystery aspect of this classic film to be ruined for you, you may want to skip ahead in the video or stop watching now. But here's a spoiler alert. While Pep, if you're watching this movie and you may, you may hear me praising his role and you may think, Matt, you're praising a very stereotypical, uh, like maybe borderline racist role because he does play a very stereotypical, like, homeless black urban kind of stereotype kind of that hollywood shuffle robert townsend thing of that's the only role available to black actors he's also playing kind of a magical negro stereotype because he's helping this uh poor uh white boy like you know a master martial arts so he can win this tournament and all of those things are true but the thing is what you find out at the end of the movie and this is the big spoiler alert and the thing that really made it stick out for me when i first saw it is that pep is actually the one who killed Luke's uh, brother at the beginning of the movie. What you find out is that uh, Luke's brother, who when he won that big fight at the beginning of the movie in the tournament, he put Pep's brother in the hospital. That was the opponent that Luke's brother was fighting at the beginning of the movie. So Pep, uh, in an act of revenge, because he and his brother, you find out, were in the same Vietnam unit together. They were both vets together. He's very close to his brother. He kills, uh, he kills uh, Luke's brother in, in vengeance. That's what he does. And so uh, Jerry Tremble, obviously, it takes him the whole movie and a series of, you know, complicated uh, red herrings to, like, figure this out. But once he does, he confronts Pep about it. And he's like, you know, why? Why all the training? And Pep, who's been reading to Luke throughout the movie from an old paperback copy of The Art of War that he keeps in his pocket, tells him straight up, uh, you know, keep your enemies close. Make them uh, be their accomplice. And he tells Luke... I had nothing against you, man. I kind of liked you. And I wanted to see if I still had what it took to train a champion. You know, you had the right motivation. Um, and he that's, and it's just such, it really, like I said, it really subverts your expectation. And you realize that Pep this whole time hasn't been, the character isn't a gross stereotype. Pep has been playing a caricature of those stereotypes. It's a performance that he created um, to an extent, for uh, Jerry Tremble's character in the movie. And the real Pep is actually nothing like that. He's this very savvy, complex, nuanced, complicated 
character. Um, and the thing I love most about the end and that confrontation is Pep tells Jerry Tremble, look, we don't need to have the big fight. I, like I said, I have no problem with you. You didn't do anything to me. Your brother messed up my brother. I got my, I got one back from my brother. I was done. So we can walk away from this right now. We don't have to have this fight. Um, and he gives Jerry Tremble that option. Like he's not, he's not looking to do him any harm. You almost end up, at least I do, I end up like rooting for Pep at the end of this movie. Not to mention the fact that he is a, a person of size. He's a fat dude like me. And he's, and what I really, another thing I really like about this movie is they have a lot of awesome, like, fat dude martial artist fighters in the movie kicking ass. You didn't see that a lot back then. But yeah, Pep creates this really, like, Marcus Aurelius and, and the screen artist of the movie really created a, like, shockingly nuanced, complex villain that you didn't see a lot in these kind of movies. And I always really, really dug that. That character and that performance and that aspect of this movie always made it stand out for me. And I love going back and watching, particularly that end scene. I love watching the whole thing because I love Pep's kind of comedic performance and the dynamic with uh, Jerry Tremble. But I love that end, end scene where he confronts them. And Pep really, like, even, even after you realize Pep is the one who killed his brother, you don't expect Pep to take the position he does, which is... I wasn't really playing you. I mean, you know, uh, I was I was in it for the money because Pep is getting ten percent of whatever Jerry Trimble wins in this in this fictitious alley fights tournament they're doing. I wanted the money, but again, I wanted to see if I could train a champion. I liked you. I didn't have any problems with you, so I did what I did, and we don't have to have this fight. You really, I end up rooting for Pep every time, and I love that character. Nothing against Jerry Trimble, but like he's a bland white kickboxer. <laughs> Seen it before. Um, a complex, nuanced villain played by a person of size who's also um, a black guy. You never saw that. You never saw that in, in 80s, uh, 90s martial arts movies. You barely see it now ever, for Christ's sake, in like mainstream movies. So that was always uh, something that really busted the tropes and really stood out to me. And one of the reasons I really like this movie. It's a great beat-em-up, great fights, uh, very gritty, down-and-dirty martial arts. Jerry Tremble, very talented martial artist. Great at what he did. Uh, but yeah... Always really like this one. Full contact. So let's do a uh, let's do our quote of the movie. We've got Ham Shack, although they're supposed to be sigh in his hands. I didn't do that really well. This is this comes from Marcus Aurelius's Pep, and it is, I know you want justice, but in these streets you gotta settle for revenge. <laughs> I love that. That's such. Here's the thing. It's a cheesy action movie quote. That's a really good cheesy action movie quote, though. You got You gotta give it. You gotta give it to him. Um, that's what I'm saying. Just that, that slight touch of elevation, that slight touch of subverting expectations and elegance in the script that takes it, uh, that takes it beyond your prototypical B action movie. That is not to say we don't have TNT to do tropes and triggers because the movie is chock full of them folks. And we're, and we're going to get to them. Um, so the down, some of the downsides we've got male gaze of plenty that's going on wall to wall. Um, the, uh, the, the girl in this movie is uh, the sister of Albert, the affable hustler who I said that uh, Jerry Trimble meets and befriends and they be, they, he's kind of staying with them. Uh, the, Albert's sister becomes the girl character. And the first time Jerry Trimble sees her, she's trying to practice ballet badly. And then she like gives up in frustration and starts doing this awful like hip hop dance in these jean shorts with cowboy boots. She's obviously not a dancer either. It's this poor actress... Uh, Denise Buick, I think her name is. Maybe not Denise, but her last name is definitely Buick. But she's trying, and it's just such a... It's such an awkward and long scene. And then you've also got your uh, stereotypical, like, uh, strip club scene in the movie. Because we got to get that TNA in there. Uh, 90s action movie. Still got to get that nudity. Also, uh, the sister character is a stripper. That's the scene where... Um, that's not another trope that should be in here, but we'll fold it into male gaze. Where the main character realizes the girl he's interested in is also a stripper. You would see that a lot in 80s movies. Um, and 80s and 90s movies. Also a fair dose of stripper shame after that scene where she talks about how she doesn't want to be doing this, but she has to because she has to pay the rent and this is the only way. Um, not that that isn't a real situation, but again, uh, you know, exotic dancers and uh, sex workers were never portrayed favorably in 80s and 90s movies. And I always felt that was, that was unfortunate. Uh, so male gays are plenty going on. That is a thing. Uh, another one is all the ethnic gangs. <laughs> At alternate points in the movie, Jerry Trimble's character is attacked by what's credited uh, in the movie as a Vietnamese gang. 
even though they are clearly all wielding um, Okinawan weapons. Literally, one of them pulls out a pair of commas. Another one, I shit you not, pulls out a pair of nunchucks and starts chucking in an alley, like you did in in the '90s if you were in an if you were in an Asian ga- in an Asian gang. Um, he also gets attacked. Yuri Trump gets attacked by a Latino gang, which is clearly a kid who has no street accent putting on that Latino gangbanger accent. It's just so prototypical. So that that is a thing. Um, I will say the the black characters in this movie they favor fairly well. Again, especially for the context of the time. Pep is an amazing uh, character, as I said. Love Marcus Aurelius. Love the nuanced performance. A lot of fighters in the tournament. Um, uh, Black Ice, even though the names are terrible. Black Ice, Ahmed Mustafa. They have a lot more layers than your your prototypical action movie characters. Interesting characters. Uh, but yeah, the 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 gang stereotypes uh, right throughout the movie. We've also got um, embarrassing cameos. We've got a lot of those, and they, they're not cameos because the people are not famous yet, but they become embarrassing cameos as people who were in this movie went off and had better careers. Uh, Michael Jai White turns up in this, a young Michael Jai White. He plays Lowball, the uh, the MC of the tournament, the underground illegal alley fights, uh, looking like an extra in a Tribe Called Quest video. And he doesn't have a fight scene in the whole movie. That's what's bananas about that. Michael Jai White, one of the single greatest martial artists uh, turned actors in American history, is in a martial arts action movie. They don't give him a single fight. They had no idea who he was or what he could do at the time, obviously. Uh, Michael McDonald turns up at one point from Mad TV. Um, also, he's he always has a role in like Paul Feige movies or Fig movies, uh, like Spy and uh, all the ones he does with Melissa McCarthy. Michael McDonald from Mad TV plays a detective that gives Jerry Tremble's character his uh, dead brother's personal effects. They're in Michael McDonald's office. This is such a ridiculous scene. He gives Jerry Tremble his his dead brother's personal effects. Jerry Tremble's dead brother. As Jerry Trimble is going through them, like his wallet, with a picture of him and his brother when he was still alive, Michael McDonald gets a phone call, and he's on the phone like, oh, hey, oh, yeah, no, I can't. My brother's coming to town. Yeah, my brother's a great guy. Yeah, no, family is the most important thing. It's the most overwrought, ridiculous scene it almost doesn't belong in the movie because the movie generally is not that incompetent but like he's literally like narrating all this shit that's supposed to be going on in jerry tremble's character's head as he's looking at his dead brother's effect he literally says that though he's like yeah my brother's a great guy family is everything it's terrible and i'm sure michael mcdonald he's not even credited in the movie i looked on imdb it's an uncredited role he just turns up out of nowhere in this terrible scene that i'm sure he wishes he could forget uh matthew willig um if you don't know the name, you know the actor. He's, he's played Lash on, um, um, oh God, I'm so sorry, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. That's probably his biggest role that you know him from. He's been on, like, My Name is Earl. He was on that show Terriers. He's the very, very statuesque, giant actor. He plays uh, Hulk in this movie, one of the fighters. And, like, even for a guy who's done some ridiculous roles, I'm sure he looks back on this like, what the hell? What did I have to do to break into this? So, yeah, a lot of embarrassing cameos going on. And, of course, we've got Sex by Sax. Oh, yeah. So there is the uh, the uber apotheosis of all cheesy 80s, 90s sex scenes in this movie. Jerry Tremble getting it on with uh, the sister character played by, I'm saying Denise Buick. That's probably wrong. While the saxophone music, it's, it's playing over the scene. It's awful. It's exactly the kind of scene that they parody in, like, MacGruber. And it lasts an excruciatingly long time. And it's nothing like human sex ever looks like. But it is set to saxophone music. Um, so those are your triggers and tropes for Full Contact. On a ham shackle scale out of 10, I give Full Contact an 8. And I drew a little picture of uh, Hudo- <laughs> Hudo- <laughs> Sorry. Um, Hudoken, uh ham shackle there. A little Street Fighter 2 ham shackle for you. So 8 out of 10 for Full Contact. Um, one of my one of my favorites uh, from the '90s, fond memories of the movie. Hunt it down if you're into if you're into '90s beat 'em ups that subvert expectations and and manage to rise a little bit above the heap. Um, I'll be back at you tomorrow with uh, with day three. We're doing 12 days of these action movies. I hope you're enjoying them so far. I'm enjoying revisiting them. Something different for the holidays. Um, if you're looking for my regular vlog, I, the, the, that episode posted today too, that's still going, the advent vlog is still going all month long. 
I'm gonna have more gift guide, ham shackles, hangry holiday giveaways still going on. Check out that video in the description. Uh, giveaway going on on my wrestling channel as well, Matt F and Wallace. If you're a wrestling fan, go check that out. I have gotta go shave and shower and suit up because tonight is The Last Jedi and my wife and I are hitting a midnight showing of it. I'm very excited. So hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you enjoyed day two of uh, Ham Shackles, Hangry Holiday Haymakers. Want to thank Brian Goff, uh, who's the artist who drew the title card, uh, the thumbnail for this video of, uh, of Hangry Ham Shackle and Fight Mode. Thank you very much for that, Brian. I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, uh, I will be back at you tomorrow with, uh, with day three. Uh, in the meantime, hope you enjoyed today's Haymaker. I'll see you tomorrow.